How many of you are thankful for your friends, right? Old friends and new friends, and welcome to Friend Day at Cross Point Church. We are so glad you guys are here. My name is Brian. Uh, I'm blessed to serve as one of the pastors here at Cross Point. And I want to start with a survey this morning. How many of you love music? Would you just kind of raise your hand if you love music? You know, I, I love music as well, too, but I have this challenge whenever I come to church. And one of the challenges that I have when I come to church is sometimes we sing and we clap at the same time. And I can't do that. <laughs> Anybody else in here rhythmically challenged like me? You know, growing up, you were at the punch bowl, at the school dance most of the time. You know, leave those people alone, okay? Those are, those are good people, good people. You know, I believe music is, is powerful. Music has the power to make us laugh. It has the power to, to make us cry, to lift our mood and also to give us the, the blues. And you know, God has wired us to respond to music. And today we're starting this brand new series called, called Lyrics. And this is a four week series where we're gonna talk about music and how music connects back to our soul. And we're gonna take some of the words of God, some of the stories in scripture, and we're gonna tie them back to some songs that are original cross point songs that our team has written. They've been working on these songs now for a couple of years. Today's song is called You Call Me Yours. Uh, it's written by our very own Kevin Ward. And uh, I I know that, yeah, man, we can clap for that. That's awesome. And I, I know it's going to have some power in your life today, but what I want to do just to kind of get us warmed up for this, this series called Lyrics is I want us to, to play some songs today. So you're going to hear some songs today. And when you came in, you should have received, okay, uh, one, of these, one of these emoji emotion things, okay? On one side, it's happy. On another side, it's, it's sad. And so we're going to play some music, and I just want you to declare, does this song make you happy? Or does this song make you sad? Now, in order to do this right, we need a DJ, right? You can't have music without a DJ. So you've heard of, of DJ Khaled. I want to introduce to you DJ Feels here today. Give a big hand for DJ Feels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sup, dog? <laughs> so... Here's how it's going to work. The DJ, DJ Feels, F-E-E-L-Z, okay? <laughs> That's great, Eddie. <laughs> what? You got that out of my office, I think, did you? <laughs> I don't know. We're going to play a song. So the DJ is going to play a song today, and then you're going to declare how it makes you feel. You ready, DJ Feels? You know it. I, that was very... That was very, like, white of me, right? That was... You know this. <laughs> All right. All right, first song, DJ. All right, here we go. You've got a friend in me. Yeah, yeah. You've got a friend If they're here, just put your arms oh, around yeah, them right now. Oh, yeah, lots of okay. friends. When Show them a little love. Rough ahead yeah. and miles All right. miles from your nice warm bed. We got a lot of friends in the house today, all right? That was good. Good way to get it started off, okay? Yeah, so yeah. here we go. Give us another one. You ready? Right, here we go. In the arms of oh, we got mixed reviews. It's all the dog lovers that make it happy. Make them happy. <laughs> oh, yeah. You've been watching those commercials at 3 o'clock in the morning. I know it. I know that's right. <laughs> All right, enough of the sadness. Enough of the sadness. Give us another song, DJ. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows Feel free to sing along if you want. And they're always glad you came. All right, next song. You ready? Yep. Here we go, DJ Fields. Wow. He's very excited. Wow. And you need to stand and jump. We totally understand today. Brian, I saw more. <laughs> I saw more excitement during that song than I did any worship song we've ever done. Thank you, guys. That makes me feel great. Hey, Thank give you. a big hand for DJ Fields today. 
<laughs> we got one more. I think. Oh, we got one more? Yeah, we got one more. Okay, hold on. The DJ's not done, all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One more actually, song. I think we got two more, actually. Oh, two, okay, two more. Here we go. Hello, darkness, my friend. I've come to talk wait. with you again. No, wait. Because no, wait. So Some of you. Yeah. It's all the melancholy people in the room. The melancholies. <laughs> All, All right. right, final song right here. You ready? Happy, sad. Give it to us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just a small town girl <laughs> living in a lonely world. <laughs> Give it up for DJ Fields Woo! today. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next four weeks, we're going to in this new series called Lyrics, as I mentioned. And as you hear these songs, man, if they resonate with your soul, man, you can be able to download them on iTunes. Look us up at Cross Point Church. It's uh, called uh, Upward, Inward, Outward. And if you like it, share it with other people. If you don't like it, just keep it to yourself, okay? Don't tell anyone else about it at all. And in this series as well, we've also started growth groups in our church. And we have uh, almost 60 different Bible studies meeting throughout the week all over North Orange County. And if you missed last week, last week was the first week, it was just an introduction. So you really didn't miss anything at all. And if you'd like to be part of a Bible store, uh, study here at North Orange County, you can be able to get on our website. And we're going to actually be taking these lyrics and taking these songs and taking it back to scripture as well. And we hope over the next few weeks that these songs will become a soundtrack for your life. Now, as I listen to this song, You Call Me Yours, I immediately thought about this guy in the Bible. He's found in Luke chapter 19. Uh, his name is, is Zach. Some of you may recognize him more as Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was this rich man who was a tax collector. Now, in order to understand what it means to be a tax collector, some of you may be thinking like IRS agent, okay? And many of you know, like whenever it comes to your taxes or you're being audited along the way, most people are not big fans of the IRS, right? Now, if you understand scripture, just to give you a little bit of context, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there were 400 years of silence, and we don't know what was happening spiritually at that time, but we can be able to go back and look, not through the Bible, but look through history, and we can find out what happened during that time period. And towards the end of that time period, Rome became an empire, and Rome began to dominate, and they swallowed up Israel. And in the middle of swallowing up Israel, they made roads. So it was called the, the Romans Road, and they were creating this infrastructure, and they needed to pay for those roads. They needed to pay for the Roman Empire. So they set up these toll booths, and they would charge tax. Now, they would set up these toll booths in the areas where the places were just filled with people as well as there was economic activity. So there were three headquarters. One was in Capernaum. Another one was in Caesarea, and then there was one in Jericho. Now, Zacchaeus, he was a tax collector in Jericho. Now, just so you can understand the climate, I remember one time hearing this guy named Lee Cockrell, uh, who was the vice president of operations for Disney, and he was speaking about leadership, and he disclosed to us one of the goals of Disney. And he said, one of our goals is that whenever you step foot onto our campus, when you enter the park, he said, what we do, he said, you don't realize it, but we're doing it to you. He said, what we do is we grab you by the ankles. And he says, and we turn you upside down. <laughs> and we shake every dollar out of you. <laughs> and he says, and if we can get you to smile while we're doing it to you, We've done a great job. Can anybody relate with that? That's exactly what the Romans were doing to the Jews, is they were taxing them on everything. So when people came through Jericho, they would set up these little toll booths, and you would come by with your cart, and they not only taxed your cart, but they taxed every wheel that was on the cart. And then they taxed and made you pay a price for the animals that were pulling the cart, as well as every item that was inside of the cart. 
So that would be like you driving down the freeway and you've got, you know, a toll road and, and you've got your little pike pass and, and you decide, you know what, I'm going to take the toll road. It's a good road. So, so you go down the toll road, then all of a sudden you get your credit card statement back and you realize that you just like way overpaid to take the toll road. And so you call them up and you're like, oh, why was this so expensive? And they said, well, we're not just taxing right now, okay, the, the cars. You don't just have to pay a, a toll for your car, but you also have to pay a toll for, for bumper stickers as well. So, so you had a bumper sticker that said baby on board. So we know you probably have a baby, so, so we're going to have to charge you for that. And then you probably have, you know, we noticed that you had one of those stickers that was like a political sticker as well too. And based upon like where you land on that is based upon how much you pay along the way. And then you also had one of those annoying stick figure, like family things, like on the back of your car. <laughs> and so we had to charge you for every stick figure that was on the back of the, the, your car along the way. So that's kind of how the Romans would, would tax people. But it wasn't the Romans that were taxing. What they would do is they would enlist Jews to tax Jews. And they set up these tax franchises. And here's the way they incentivize Jewish people to be able to tax their own people. As they said, we're going to allow you to collect all the money above for yourself. Here's what Rome requires, but you can charge more. So you can imagine the corruption that was taking place at that day and time. So a Jew that owned a tax franchise was known as a traitor among the Jewish population. And it was so well known that they set up rules and they said, listen, if you're a tax collector, you're not allowed to testify in a court of law because you can't be trusted. And if you're a tax collector, you're not allowed to enter into the temple to worship because you are the chief of sinners and you're not allowed to be able to come in here. So they were labeled. They were labeled thieves and they were labeled traitors. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been labeled? Has anybody ever put a, a, a label on you? You know, from the day that we came out of our mother's womb, we've been on this lifelong search for our own identity. And when you were a toddler, we learned these identity defining statements like, no, or I can do it myself. I don't need help. And then as we get older, we become teenagers and we get new styles and new hairdos. And we start listening to different kinds of music. And we start trying to fit into different types of groups. And we do that, and here's why we do that, because we're trying to define who we are. And we're trying to craft our identity. Am I an athlete? Am I a musician? Am I a nerd? Am I a gamer? Am I a dancer? Am I the bully? And we're on this quest to find our identity. And then as you and I get older, our, our labels all of a sudden get more refined. And they become more important to us. Because now I'm rich. Now I'm successful. Or now I'm poor. Or I'm black. Or I'm white. Or I'm a man. Or I'm a woman. Or, or maybe things happen around you that dictate who you are. I'm the pretty one. I'm the smart one. I'm the shy one. I'm the alcoholic. I'm the one that was abused. I'm the one that's angry. And as we begin to scroll through social media, on one hand, when we recognize our tribe, it gives us some comfort. But on the other hand, as we begin to scroll through social media, we create, it creates this animosity toward those that don't fall under your label. So today, we have conservatives that are against liberals. And we have whites that are against blacks. And we have men that are against women. And in the wake of all of this labeling is rage and anger and bitterness and violence, and judging people. And I don't know about you, but I feel it more in our country than I've ever experienced it, never felt it before. But here's what's really interesting, is that Jesus loves all people. 
and that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And Jesus loves everyone. And not only does Jesus love you, Jesus likes you as well. And if you wear a label, whatever your label may be, mom, father, husband, whatever it may be, single, whatever it may be, I'm here to tell you today that God loves people that wear labels. And even tax collectors. And if you, you really look through scripture and you get to the New Testament, you find the very first book in the New Testament is a book called Matthew. And Matthew began to write the story of Jesus' life. And Matthew was one of the followers of Jesus. He was a disciple. And do you know what his occupation was? He was a tax collector. Jesus loved the tax collectors, the people no one else loved. So in Luke chapter 19 and verse 2, I've got it on a screen. It says that Jesus entered Jericho. He made his way through the town. And it says there was a man there named Zacchaeus. And he was the, what's the next word, church? He's not just a tax collector. He's the chief. He's the kingpin in the Jericho tax cartel. He is a modern day mafia man. He's the chief tax collector in the region. And he had become very what, church? Very rich. He gained a lot of money through this franchise that he owned. And what I find very interesting about this is that Jesus was passing through the city limits. He was about to go down one of those Roman roads. He was about to go through the toll booth. There's only one way through the town. And Jesus was a rock star in his day and time. By this time in Luke 19, he had performed several miracles. He had healed people. He had fed the 5,000. Word had spread. And people were like, I want to know Jesus. I want to get to know him. He's like a celebrity. It's like, at the very least, I want to see a miracle, right? So everywhere Jesus went, large crowds began to surround him and follow him. And so here's Zacchaeus, and he hears Jesus is coming down his toll road. And so he wants to get a look. So it says, verse 3, he tried to get a look at Jesus. Now, I don't know why he wanted to see Jesus. Maybe he was just in it to see if maybe, you know, he's going to do a miracle. Maybe it was curiosity. Maybe he felt a desire to be free from his guilt. Maybe he wanted a clear conscience. Maybe he wanted a better life. But he had a problem. It says he was too short to see over the crowd. This man had short man syndrome. <laughs> if it was the 90s, he would have been in this music video by this guy named Skilo. I wish I was a little bit taller. Wish I was a baller. We don't know how tall Zacchaeus was. Maybe he was five feet tall. Who knows? Maybe he was four feet, six inches. But I bet this guy, <laughs> Rosie's four feet, six inches tall, all right? I bet this guy, though, I bet he avoided crowds. I bet, I bet he was at a place where he was like, I get made fun of everywhere that I go. I, I bet this man felt the two greatest fears that I believe every single one of us as human beings will feel. They're the worst things. And you take any of your anxiety, depression, you boil it all down, and it usually comes back to one of these two things. You don't feel loved, or you don't feel like you're enough. And I think Zacchaeus felt both of those things. He wanted to get a glimpse of Jesus. He wanted to look at Jesus. He's too short. Here's a man that lived in luxury, but he loathed in loneliness. Here's a man that was afflicted by affluence. He just wanted to, to see Jesus. So what he did is he climbed up a tree. He decided, I've got to have the perfect seat for the Jesus parade that's about to come by. So he climbs up the tree, and in verse 5, Luke chapter 19 and verse 5, it says, when Jesus came by, he gets by the tree, he looked up at Zacchaeus. And I imagine Zacchaeus probably froze. He either froze or he was shaking in his sandals. 
And Jesus stops, he looks at him, and he's called him by name. And he says, Zacchaeus. Anybody remember the song as a little kid growing up in Sunday school? You come down, for I'm going to your house today. Now, did you just notice what Jesus did? Jesus just invited himself over for dinner. That's like the most inappropriate thing to do. Like I teach my kids all the time. Like, hey, we're at church. Don't invite yourself over to anybody's house for dinner. Just chill out a little bit. But Jesus says, I'm coming over to your house today. And here's what I notice. And you're going to notice this in the lyrics of the song that we're going to sing. And you're going to notice this in the life of Zacchaeus. And I believe that you can also see this in your own life. Is that our God is a calling God. He calls us out. He calls you by name. He knows who you are. And he calls him, Zacchaeus, I am called. And he's inviting Zacchaeus out of his shame. Here's the number one hero in Israel. Here is a celebrity. And he's on his way to Zacchaeus' house. Now, can you imagine that just for a moment? That Jesus is about to come over to your house and the worst part of this is that you didn't know what was happening. Men, let me ask you, married men, have you ever brought somebody over to your house without telling your wife about it? Just randomly brought somebody into the house? You only do that once, right? It's like, no, 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 no. You can't just bring somebody over because we got to clean up. We got to make sure there's lines on the carpet, Right? And those lines better be straight. No crooked lines, okay? This is it's the way it's got to be. We got to make sure it's perfect. Can you imagine the creator of the universe is walking into your house? Now, now, that's a little scary too, though. I mean, because what if he were to walk into your house? What if he picked up your remote control, fired up your Netflix, and started searching through what was previously watched? Might be a little discomforting. What if Jesus were to pick up your iPhone? He knows all. He doesn't need a code. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He's like, pff, 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 pff. <laughs> and what if he were to look through your phone? Man, would there be any discomfort that may be there? I mean, here's Jesus. What if he were to go into the internet browser and search for history? Would there be any discomfort there? Now, here's what's interesting, though, is Jesus didn't come to judge. We might think that he comes to judge. He didn't. He came to seek and to save those that are lost. If you've ever been driving and you're lost, you, you might need some help. You might need some direction. He said, I'm not coming to ream you out because you're lost. What I'm doing is I'm coming to provide you hope and a better tomorrow because I know the plans for you. It's to prosper you. It's to give you peace. It's to give you purpose. It's to give you new life. Now, these professional Christians are, are sitting back. They're called Pharisees. And they're grumbling and complaining. And Luke 19 says, when they see him walking to Zacchaeus' house, they start saying, can you believe he's going to Zacchaeus' house? Doesn't he know about Zacchaeus? Doesn't he know he's a tax collector? Like the worst of all sinners? I wonder how much Zacchaeus is paying him to come over. I, I, I wonder, I'm not going to say anything, okay? I'm not going to say anything, but this is not good. What's Jesus getting himself mixed up in? Doesn't he understand how bad? Doesn't he understand his past? Jesus walks into his house, and Zacchaeus quickly finds out that Jesus, he's not the guest. Jesus turns out to be the host. He's the host of the party. And, and verse 7 happens when he comes over, and the curtain drops. And it's like end of scene. And we don't know what happened that night. We don't know what they had for dinner. We don't know what their conversation was. We don't know that, that Zacchaeus, you know, said this, and then Jesus said this, and then Jesus was like, hey, why don't you pray this prayer after me? And then Zacchaeus like repeats it after him. We don't, we don't get any of that. We don't know anything. Now, my personal belief is that that was a defining moment in Zacchaeus' life, and you're going to see it as you get past into verse 8. 
That was something happened in that encounter with Jesus Christ. My personal belief is that Zacchaeus surrendered to Jesus. My personal belief is he said, listen, you're my savior. You're the boss of my life. You're the coach. I'm not taking direction from Rome anymore or from my own sin, but from you. You're the boss, you're the coach, you're the CEO of my life, and I'm all in. Now, we don't know what happened. All we know is that he went to the house, curtain drops, end of scene. But then in verse 8, the second thing happens. He is transformed. And what you're going to see in the lyrics of this song and what you see in Zacchaeus' life and what you can see in your life as well is that when you have an encounter with Jesus, you will be transformed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any person be in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is passed away and all is become new. And Jesus wants to give you a fresh start. It doesn't matter what happened last night, last week, last year, five years. He says, listen, you get a reboot. You ever had your computer go down and, and it's like, what's going on with it? And you just reboot it and all of a sudden it resets. Maybe some of you today need a reset in your life today to be transformed. Zacchaeus acknowledges the error of his ways. And here's what's interesting in verse 8. It's on the screen. It says, Zacchaeus, he stood before the Lord. It's like he made some kind of a stand. He made some kind of a declaration. It's like, like those people last week at the beach, all right, 18 of you guys, 18 of you last week said, I have decided, I am declaring that I'm going God's way instead of the world's way. He took a stand and he said, I'm gonna give half of my wealth to the poor. That's like extravagant generosity. That was not required by the law of that time. He says, I'm taking 50% out of my bank account. I'm going to give it to the orphans. I'm going to give it to the least, the last, and the lost. And then he says, and those that I've cheated, the people that have cheated people in their taxes, the people that I've Bernie made off, I'm going to give them back four times as much. So if I took $1,000, I'm going to give you $4,000. If I took $10,000, I'm going to give you $40 thousand back. Now, can I tell you, this is not a money about message. Okay, God, God didn't want your money. That's, that's not what it requires to be a salvation. All right, what God says is, is where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And what you see is you see a heart shift from being all about Zacchaeus to all of a sudden being about other people as well. So all of a sudden, this taker becomes a giver. That's transformation. All of a sudden, this extortionist becomes a philanthropist. This is transformation. For him, it's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. This is a life of transformation. And Jesus comes back and he says, this is what true salvation looks like. And Zach says, I welcome your truth into my life. These are the lyrics of the song, and I think he would sing this song loudly. Love invaded all of my heart, and it invaded all of my mind. That the enemy's lies, because there's so many lies in our head. Do you ever have the enemy's lies in your head? The enemy's lies, they have to leave. And I'm going to listen to you, Jesus, and I'm going to believe. And when you have an encounter with Jesus, Jesus doesn't just inform you. Jesus doesn't just inspire you. Jesus transforms you from the inside out. And the third thing happens, and the final thing happens, is he says, I am pure. Now, I want you to go back to verse 9. Luke chapter 19 and verse 9, it's on the screen. Jesus responded, and he said, listen, salvation has come to this home today. Salvation happened here. This man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Now, if you know anything about Jewish culture, that's the highest compliment. There's no greater compliment to a Jew than to say that you are the son of Abraham. Have you ever studied to know what your name means? Have you ever looked up your name? And what your name actually means. In biblical days, this was everything. Everybody knew what your name meant. And so everybody would, you know, basically call you by your name, knew what it meant. I, I did a little study. My wife, Shannon, Shannon, her name comes from the, the Irish word Shannon, and it means little 
old wise one. <laughs> and she said, get rid of that old, okay? I'm fine with just a little wise one. Eddie, DJ feels over here. His name comes from the French word. It means to think that you are wealthy, prosperous, and rich. To think, Eddie, to think. <laughs> and Jeff, many of you know Jeff, our family pastor. His comes from the English root word that means lover of Chick-fil-A. <laughs> His word actually means, means traveler, which I think is very fitting for Jeff. My name, Brian, I looked it up. It means lover of Shannon. <laughs> Here's what it really means. Well, that really is true too. It means strength and honor. Do you know what Zacchaeus means? The name Zacchaeus? It means, catch this, this gives me goosebumps when I think about it. It means pure and blameless. And I believe for Zacchaeus' his entire life that this was a source of mockery for him. His whole life, people said, Zacchaeus, pure, blameless, are you kidding me? You're a tax collector. He had been labeled. His whole life, he lived not feeling like he was loved, not feeling like he's enough but he was appropriately named. Because even though his life wasn't always pure when you look in the rearview mirror, Jesus said, forget the things which are behind you, Zacchaeus, and reach forth into those things which are ahead of you. And you are pure. See, because I've called you. See, because I've transformed you. And because I've transformed you, you are pure in my sight. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. This is my identity, he would say. It's Christ in me. And it doesn't say, and I'm sure the crowd would have been happy to hear this, that Zacchaeus, if you clean up your life, then I'll come into your home. Zacchaeus, if you clean up your life, then I'll come into your life. Hey, if you clean up your life, then I'll be your friend. Hey, if you clean up your life, then I'll love you. He says, no, I'm coming into your life, period. I don't care what's happened in the past. I don't care what's happened in the present. Here I am because I loved you first. And because I loved you first, then we will work on this transformation together. But the transformation only happens when Christ is inside of you. And as a result, Jesus cleans up his life and changes his life. I'll leave you with this story. I was reading about water safety courses. I know that sounds really random. And there's this cardinal rule. And the cardinal rule is this, is that whenever somebody is drowning and when they're splashing and thrashing all around, the cardinal rule is don't try to save them at that moment. Because if you try to save them when they still think that they can save themselves, they're a very dangerous individual. And what they'll do is in the midst of trying to save themselves, they will take their hand and they will put it on top of your head and they will push you underwater while they try to pull themselves up to be able to grasp for some air. And in that moment, they're not only a danger for themselves, but they're also a danger for you. So here's the correct procedure. You swim out to them as close as you can be able to get to them. And you wait and you wait until they're helpless and you wait and you wait until they're hopeless and you wait until they do not have any more belief that they can be able to do this in their own power and their own strength and when they're finally at that moment you make your move make your move and that is whenever you rescue them and I believe the same thing is true with our relationship with Jesus because we're splashing and thrashing in this world today. We're splashing and thrashing at this thing we call life. And God is standing right there waiting for you. And he's just waiting for you to say, I surrender. 
I surrender. I can't do this in my own strength and my own power, but I trust you and I will obey you. And when you get to that moment, Jesus says, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. And when no one else is coming, I'm coming. I'm coming to your house.